else you have to, even though the principle is the same, you may have to relearn some of your materials and tools to make it work. So that was the idea for this table. Art and physics. We also just dying to talk about hacking into two different systems. All right. Okay, so uh, we're math and art, and um, so we obviously started talking about geometry because we had that in common. And, um, and so uh, I was talking about um, how I teach. I teach a pretty developmental math. So um, I always use the example for circles having 360 degrees because it started with like people standing on the earth and tracking the stars. <coughs> five days in a year, so they got pretty close, even back in ancient times, and so we uh, thought about um, introducing that sort of concept with a, on, a zoetrope, which is that little circle thing where you draw your pictures on a strip of paper, and you put it inside, and then you spin it and look through, and you see the animation that goes. It's like one of the earliest forms of animation before film or potentially even photography actually got started. It started as like a child's toy, something that they could stay, you know, <laughs> busy with as kids, but allowing the students to potentially make their own using maybe simple geometric shapes and make a ball bounce or make something appear to spin so that they're not necessarily needing to have any fundamental drawing skills, but they can take into consideration, okay, how many images or how many, you know, how should I divide these angles to have the most fluid sense of motion while still learning, you know, the math and the things and the hands-on activity lab sort of scenario. Just those two. We have time for one more. Somebody else just dying to talk. Or you want to go to the next session? Okay. Oh, oh here we go. Other room with me since I have two actual students at my table. So So uh, the the feedback that I got when I asked the question, what are, what are you what are we not doing for you? What, what are we what do you wish you were learning that we're not doing? And the pretty clear answer was real life stuff. You you, you learn the the didactic math, science, history, and so on. But um, who who knows how to change the tire the first time they get a flat tire when you're 18 and you've never had to do that before? Um, so uh, another reference was made to the at the southeast campus of these are southeast students there's uh, this gravel parking lot out on the east side of the building and so uh, there was a project that was done to evaluate the safety of the gravel parking what are the issues with parking on gravel versus parking on paved road or dirt mud etc um, and those things tie together um, in that if, let's say, your tire goes flat and you're trying to change your tire for the very first time on a gravel parking lot, what's the safety there? Gravel is shifty. Are you using a jack? Does your jack move? How do you brace the jack? How does, how does the set of tools that you use differ in a different environment for a real life situation that you're probably going to encounter at some point? Um, the overall structure of the class was much more uh, question-based. So instead of lecture, standing at the front and telling them, here are the concerns that you should have when you are changing your tire according to this PowerPoint. It was, let's show up to class, lock all the students' bags and stuff in the class. Now, let's, in a group, go walk around the campus. And the students, you tell me, what's wrong here? What do you see wrong? Or what do you see that could be better? Let's take this gravel parking lot, for example. The students are actually the ones parking there. Staff aren't. We typically don't have to park in the gravel. We have a reserved spot. The students are actually facing that gravel every day. For them, that's a, an opportunity to explore how could we design this, how could we change this, um, and they get to self-direct uh, and define the problem themselves. Um, what tools do we have? Then they, the students get to talk to each other. What, does anyone here know anything about this? What are our skills? What, what can people do? What materials do we already so that, that was the basic structure of ours. So you hacked the classroom and turned a gravel parking lot into a makerspace, essentially. 
All right, um, as we move on, in your programs, we have two concurrent sessions. Well, it turns out we only have one, the next one. Um, our UTA uh, colleague had to go back up to Denton, or back over to Arlington. Um, so we just have the one, which is making across the curriculum. So let's look at some real life examples of people that have active disciplines and uh, are working across uh, the disciplines. So I'm gonna have these guys introduce themselves. Christian, do you wanna start? Hi, my name is Christian Deleon. I teach at Northwest Campus. And your discipline um, is? Visual Arts. I teach, uh, yeah. Did I, I didn't even see, I'm sorry. It was a late night. And, yes, twins, young twins. And through two uh, three year olds, please bear with me. Uh, I teach digital art, design one, and art appreciation. And, uh, hi everyone, my name is Johan San Quijano, and I'm part of the English faculty here at uh, Trinity River. Um, I actually got into making uh, towards the latter part of my graduate studies. Um, you know, English is not a discipline that you would usually think, yeah, that leads itself to making. Um, and I didn't think so as well when I started working on my master's on uh, 19th century literature. I just thought, I'm going to read stuff and talk to my students about what I read. Uh, but when I uh, shifted gears to my PhD, I focused on rhetoric. My mom was kind of expanded. Um, I discovered that rhetoric is more than just persuasion, but that there are things like rhetoric of media, including social media, the rhetoric of images, and so on. And I started thinking, how can I, how can I implement these things uh, into my courses, especially um, you know, undergrad courses? And uh, that's how I um, ended up creating a project that is what I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. So. So, uh, oh, I'm not sure what that is. Making a process of the No. No? Okay. Something square with the other. Um, so I want to start with a question. How many of you like puppies? All right, cool. Uh, so uh, it, it seems like a weird question to start with, but uh, let's suppose that you're one day just kind of uh, browsing through Instagram and why is the video not playing? Okay, pardon, it seems like this was corrupted and let's see if we can start again. There we go. So you're browsing through Instagram. We all know what that app is, right? You scroll around, look at pictures and all that good stuff. Um, and you find this account called Popperks, um, where they just post pictures of cute puppies, um, and it looks pretty well curated. Um, you notice how they have some videos. You click on the videos, and it's like just kind of puppies frolicking around. And you're like, you know what? I'm really high on that you know, puppy dog high. I want to look at more puppy pictures. Uh, so we try to find them on Twitter and we look at the kind of stuff that they post. Um, and you see that dog in a box, it's kind of like the same dog over a little fluffy thing. Um, and you start wondering, poppers, what is this? Like? Just like they post pictures of dogs or do they do more? Um, so you start doing some research and you find their website. There we go. And it turns out that their website is one that sells uh, if you're familiar with the concept of mystery boxes, where you subscribe and they send you a bunch of stuff. So you go to this website because you love your puppy so much and uh, you scroll through it to make sure that it's not a scam, right? Because we don't want to give some random person our social security number or credit card number and so on. They have their phone number information and so on. And it's a really well designed site. Um, it has, uh, you know, colorful images and bright spots. They have their mission and vision statements. 
Um, you know, it, it's a pretty good looking website. This is actually a website that I show my students when I tell them, as part of your course, you need to design a website. Right? I give them a semester long project and website creation is uh, one part of it. So why would I show them this website specifically? Because this is a website that one of my students' groups created. Right? And, and they actually set up a store, but I, I personally were an interesting story. They were actually collecting credit card data. They told them, no, don't do that. Disconnect the store. Make sure that it gives you an error. Right? Um, and so they did that. And now once you go to the checkout, it's like, you know, the store's not configured. You need to update your account and so on. Um, so some students created that as part of a semester-long project in which they get to make stuff. They need to make a product. They need to brainstorm. I put them in groups of four to six students, and they need to think, what do I want to sell? Um, a lot of them take what I'd like to think is the, the easy route, which is the, the kind of mystery box thing, where they design a box and they put some stuff in it that they don't have to make. Others take a more complex route. And I'm going to show you some of their work as well. Um, in addition to making stuff, they need to establish a corporation. And so I guide them through uh, what documents of incorporation would look like, including mission statement, vision statement, how they're going to serve the community. I give them forms that I download uh, from government websites for them to fill in, and that's part of their semester-long uh, group project. They need to create social media campaigns in order to promote their uh, products, and part of the evaluation is how many followers they get, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram. Um, I actually give them a choice. They need to make a Twitter, a website, um, a YouTube account, and then some other form of social media. Some of them just do Pinterest, which is pretty easy. Others go with Instagram, which is a little bit more difficult to find followers. Some of them do Facebook. Um, one group uh, last semester did a MySpace page. Which, which I thought, why would you do that? So does anyone know why anyone would choose MySpace over any other social media account? Why? Maybe you're doing music, MySpace. Yeah. That's correct. They were doing a company where, where it's kind of like a, a buy-sell trade for records. So they opened up their, uh, their MySpace page. And, and it was really ugly, but you know, it, 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 you know, they did fine. Um, they have to write four monthly reports. Um, in each of those reports, they need to update uh, us on the progress that they're making towards the establishment of their company, their product, and so on. Uh, and so these would be parallel to quarterly reports that you see in actual corporations. And they have to update the shareholders, with the shareholders being their classmates. Um, at any given point, the classmates are both owners of their company and shareholders for everyone else's company. And so when they present, I let their classmates kind of grill them. Uh, you know, so are you going to make income? What, what do you think? Uh, you know, what happens if someone finds some kind of video offensive? Um, and with this uh, actual company, the puppy one, I don't know if you've seen that video where they cut a cake that's shaped like a puppy and then the dog becomes traumatized. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so they actually wanted to, I'm not going to show it here because like, I feel bad for a few but uh, they actually wanted to put that video up and uh, I didn't say anything about it. I was just going to let them make a blunder. And one of their classmates said, well, you know, that's kind of cruel. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I think maybe we won't do that. And instead, they made a commercial, which I would like to share with you now. And hopefully we have audio. Yes. So, 
Um, in this project, what did they make? Um, in addition to you know the traditional English-related stuff, documents, they made a website. They made the company logo, that little puppy face there, um, is uh, an original creation from the students. Uh, the box, I, I don't know how to rewind this here, but um, the box that came in the mail, uh, the design was part of it, which I know that some of you might be thinking, well, that's not a very good design. Admittedly, that's one of the weaknesses in my course. I don't have enough time to go over uh, design principles, so teaming up with someone like Christian, for example, would be uh, you know, great for this kind of project. Um, skip. All right, so how did this start? It actually started with something more traditional in the English discipline uh, with blogs. I would ask my students, you know what, you need to create a blog and you know, post at least uh, 10 articles over the course of the semester. Make sure that it looks nice. Um, and this uh, came from the intersection of digital disciplines and humanities where they needed to create code, consider visual design, things like HTML, CSS, and so on. Uh, but interestingly, uh, one thing that I noticed during these early stages of the semester-long project is that whenever students would ask me for advice, they would either take it or reject it depending on how I phrased it. If I said, for example, best practices include one, two, and three, then they would do that. If instead I said, well, I would probably do, then they would just do something completely different. Um, and so what I've taken uh, of doing as a play is if I want them to avoid doing something, I tell them that's exactly what I would do. Um, and then 85 to 90 percent of the time it works and they come up with something uh, interesting. Um, and so um, as the project kind of evolved, uh, students started coming up with services. Uh, this one from uh, one student corporation, uh, they called it Truly Confident. Hey, and what they did. I'm just going to be keeping you guys an eyebrow tutorial today. So I'm going to be using the this. Anastasia Beverly Hills. Okay, so uh, in this company, they decided to create a service where they would put up tutorial videos on YouTube. This would be one of them. They created their website with mission, vision, and so on. Instagram to show um, that they were actually competent at the makeup business. And uh, they were in the process of creating an app where people could say, um, you know, local app in the area, where people could say, you know what, I need makeup services, come and do makeup at my home. And then one of them would go over um, and do makeup on the spot. Um, the semester ended before they could complete the app, um, but they did finish the layout. Um, it was basically a giant button that said, uh, you know, service required, we need help, and then they would put in, uh, you know, the address information, the user would put in the address information. So again, for this pr uh, project, design, not the strongest component, making a pretty strong component, right? And, you know, each discipline has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, that's okay. something that we want to take into consideration. Uh, Snackbox uh, was another subscription service. This one, I like that. They actually uh, created the logo using Photoshop. That's one of the more complex programs uh, for image editing. Uh, some of my students, what they would do is, and I'm, I'm going to pause here and show you a website real quick. Does this is have uh, Chrome or Firefox? Did you look it up? Does this is have Chrome or Firefox here? Cool, well, let's pull it up. Are we, we're not showing? Let's put it up there. What happened? Okay, if I put up the presentation. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it needs to be a presentation. Uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, so a lot of them, and there's something that you, you might want to take, uh, you know, make note of. Cool text. They would just go to cool text, the cool text graphics generator. Um, they would choose a font, I'm going to use this one because it's cute, um, and they would put in the name of their company. I'm, I'm going to use my company, Primitive Thoughts. And then, poof, that's their logo. And they would download it, put it in their website, right? But uh, Snapboss, I really like what they did, because they actually used Photoshop, they manually, there we go, perfect, they manually designed the logo. Um, their box was really interesting, uh, because it included candies and snacks, 
from the world over. So they bought stuff from Japan, India, Russia, the Caribbean, and so on. Uh, the downside of this project, though, was, again, the box design. It was just a cardboard box. Um, I'm not sure why the commercial is not fine, but that's fine. Um, sometimes, though, I will get students who are taking a design course. And in those cases, they create you know, amazing looking websites, like this one that we see here. Uh, this group wanted to create a service where you could go if you have some kind of eye condition, you would get measured and get designer eyeglasses, custom made. Um, I think they went a little bit high on the prices. They, they start at $700 for the service plus eyeglasses, right? Um, but the website itself is different than any of the others that I've seen. Um, usually students go to Wix, they click on create my website for me, um, and you just get a single page static. Uh, sometimes they'll go to WordPress or Blogger and they'll force a blog to look like a website, and then you have the more traditional kind of late two, uh, early 2000s blog style um, with the sections on the top. This one I really like that it has some menu on the side, uh, it's static and then it scrolls uh, on the right side. Uh, so this is something that uh, you can get when you have an actual hacking, if you will, from, you know, to borrow from the previous section, um, of, you know, design language and computer science. Right. And so um, most of the products that I get are either digital in nature or I'm not sure it's the term fits, but it's the only one that I have so far, recycled stuff, where they buy something, they repurpose it, um, you know, pack stuff better. Uh, repurpose it, and they present that as their new product. Um, but I had one student last semester um, who actually went to the extra step of 3D printing stuff. Um, I told them, uh, like Jay and Lucas were mentioning in the previous section, you know what, if you could take some of those uh, cat models modify them a little bit and make them your own, that would be even better. Um, and so that's what they did. They created a website, uh, unfortunately named Osteus Designs and Miniatures, um, in which um, this, their homepage with the little video of the three printer, uh, they created this, their original product, this little multicolored space people. Um, and then I really like that they did this, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, where, where you have uh, dice that are beyond six sides. You have 20 side die, 10 side die. They created this box to carry those, and then of course, uh, you know, the thing that they put somewhere, miniatures, like this one here in the middle, uh, for games like Warhammer, and so on. Um, these little miniatures that you see here were really interesting. I saw the process that they went through to put together. Um, and the little ghost, for example, let me go to the next one. That little ghost is actually three parts. The teeth are one part of the product. Uh, the black section here in the mouth is the second part, and then the, the outline of the ghost itself is the third part. So they would have to print out that stuff, put it together in manufacture, if you will. Um, and then we'll go over that. Um, so these are some of the other uh, cool stuff that this specific section uh, of students made. Um, but again, that is the one uh, group that has ever made anything uh, from scratch. And so I'm going to encourage um, some more of that moving forward. Um, and I'm running this experiment again uh, this semester. I guess at this point we could call it a practice rather than an experiment. Um, and they come up with some interesting stuff. Uh, some of them already have some pretty good uh, websites. Uh, so Tobova, this is from uh, one of my students groups, and what they want to create is uh, an app where they sell and deliver boba tea, um, because they say everyone loves boba, right? And so I see a couple of heads spotting it off, right? So uh, imagine an app where wherever you're at, you click, you know, bring me boba, and then just, they just bring it over, it shows up there magically, so that's kind of their thing. Uh, Z-Band is a weird one, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing how they pull it off. What they want to create is a set of earmuffs that you can put on while you sleep to block out sound, but that you can also program to serve as an alarm. But the additional component is that it gives you an electric shock if you don't wake up, <laughs> right? So, so that's an interesting project. Uh, project. If you look up their Twitter, Z-Band, it, it's all their products are like, 
the future will shock you. Something shocking is coming. Right? So they're already kind of building up uh, that brand hype. Um, and, and I want to see if they're just going to take headphones and put some lumps in it, or maybe just, I don't know, use that little chalker that you use for pranks. Um, you know, how they work this out is going to be, I think, really ingenious. Um, Freshfields is one of the other um, companies that uh, students are making this year, and uh, I haven't given them a deadline yet for the website, which is why I was really surprised when I saw this in my inbox. I think we already have a website. Um, and this one is a service, what they're making, um, where if you are part of an HOA or uh, you're the administrator of a building complex, uh, you contact them and they will pick up after your pets. Right? So you can just take your pets, you let them do their business wherever, and then they come on, they, they come in in the morning and in the evenings, and they just clean the area up. Um, and this seems to be a really good idea. They already have uh, 100 Instagram followers. Um, this picture is from uh, before. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this morning they had over 100 Instagram followers, and uh, you know they were actually panicking when, when they went live. They said, uh, "Professor, we have people following us. What do we do?" I'm like, "Just don't worry about it. You'll be all right." Um, you know, so that's a really cool idea. Um, and then this one, I'm actually really excited for uh, this semester. Uh, they're creating a sweets catering business. Um, you can have an app, or you can phone it in, or you can order it through the website. Uh, what's important is that if you want some kind of sweet, like a cake or a cupcake or something like that, um, then they'll bring it to you. And the reason that I'm really excited is because part of the project is that for the last shareholders meeting, you have to present your product, right? So um, for the students that are offering services, I'm asking them to make some kind of collectible or, or memorabilia. Uh, for the students who are making the electrocution band, they have to bring in a band that actually electrocutes me once I touch it. Hopefully I won't die. Um, and so of course, you, you can see what I'm looking forward to this, because like, I, I like cupcakes. Right? Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what they cook. Right? Um, and so that's kind of how I implement making in my English classes. Um, I guess any questions or anything like that before I hand it up to the very awesome uh, Christian Delahome? Cool. Uh, we can have a, a, an open panel later on. So, um, uh, first question. Yes. How, what, what components do you require them to have for each project and what components are just, or do you just say, here's what I want you to do in general and make it happen? Mm -hmm. Do they have to have a mm -hmm. mission statement? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so those are for the uh, document of incorporation. They need to have um, title, company logo, uh, mission statement, vision statement, goal. Purpose, uh, the list of their um, CEOs, the, the officers, um, as well as a short narrative explaining why their product is unique. So that could be you know one to two paragraphs. Um, the second document that I ask them to write uh, is an audience analysis. I give them a series of questions, um, and uh, they need to tell me if their target audience for the product is, for example, you know, the 20 to 30 year olds, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so that one is a uh, kind of question, short paragraph, question, short paragraph. Um, once they've done that, they need, to, they need to synthesize that document and include that in the website under who do we serve, right? So essentially who's our target audience. Um, and then the other two documents, it really depends on how I see uh, the semester it's, this is going. It, one might be um, an update document saying this is the progress that we've done so far. This is what we project to do in the future. Um, and then at the end, it would need to be an IPO, like initial uh, offering, uh, where they say, this is our company, this is what we've accomplished, and this is how much our stock should be worth. Um, and, and the final exam um, is, is essentially stock bidding. Um, and depending on who gets the most votes, then you know, that who gets more points than the other one, that kind of stuff. Um, for the social media stuff, they need to have the logo, a banner, uh, a certain number of posts. For Twitter, I require at least 20. Uh, for Instagram, I just let them do more than 10, however many they want, because it's like image-based. Um, and then for the website, they need to have the home section, the about us section, which is uh, the documents of incorporation, paraphrased, uh, some kind of store or service, a contact page that works. And so this could be a form that I fill in, or a little chat, or a phone number, 
uh, whichever one they put up, I contact them through it. Um, and then the product itself. Um, and then I should know this, I'm the only thing that we know this semester, right? it's a, the traditional you know, English as proposal and so on. Uh, but as far as the making, uh, you know, that's what goes into it. Right. I, I find it really great. Uh, I, I mean, I'm curious, you think you kind of just answered the, the, the kind of reach of your social media platforms, which you said Twitter, Instagram, and the website. Is there, um, is, is, does that go farther? Or it, and it also, is there, what, as far as interconnectivity between those happens? Oh, as far as interactivity, yes. Um, I need to be able to get to any platform, any other platforms from any other. So if I log on to Twitter and I can't get to their web page from Twitter, that's points off. If I go to their web page and they don't have any links to anything, that points off, right? So all their platforms need to be connected. Um, I'm that, that, that wasn't quite what I was asking. That, okay. That's just linkage. I mean, uh, interconnectivity and say I post on the website, it posts to Instagram and to Twitter at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that there's not this like, I have to appropriate every single website to yes. post, you know, so every post is on the same thing. Okay, okay. Um, are, are you thinking about automated process? Automated process. Uh, sadly, I don't know how to do that. One group did figure out how to do that and actually asked them, why are you posting like the same thing over and over and over? Um, but, but then when they explained it to, to me, I'm like, okay, cool. Um, but, but I'm still not sure how to yeah. get them to do that yet. Um, so, yeah. You know, what are, is, this is an English class, after all. Yeah, not much sure. Question over here, and then we probably need to get going. I'm sorry. Uh, that's a pretty good business problem, right? Because you're going to have to have business project. I wonder if anybody asked to go further and manufacture that problem, um, and get into the real life business. No, you mean students following up on it? Yeah, students, right. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, but we only start, I only started doing this uh, project uh, four years ago. Um, so maybe some of them will pick up. And, and indeed, the, the doggy cleaning business guy, he said that because of the kind of feedback that he was getting, he might actually look into uh, following up on that. Do we have anybody here from the business school or from computer science that might want to jump in on this? Just going across the disciplines. All right, so we're right in the middle of this session. Do we need to? I uh, tried to be fancy by having it up my own typeface uh, that I purchased from one of my favorite designers, and it's caused nothing but problems this morning. Lesson learned. I'll probably do it again. Shh. Selfishly, I always say selfishly, it helps 
they're concerned about cost and how many times they are printing a thing, whether it's 2D or 3D, tell them don't worry about that. The only thing I tell them is that I want a copy so I can show you off, I can show our department off. I think that's where this whole thing started, right? Because when I went to school at UNT, another name, they had to pay for everything. They had to pay for prints by the square inch. It wasn't cheap. Um, digital art class is always evolving. Just like technology, I started to teach digital art from the standpoint of Photoshop and Illustrator. And I stuck to those for about three years. Fred Spaulding, our ceramics and sculpture instructor, purchased a 3D printer which frightened me. In 2016, it was sitting in a box for a while and I had students put it together because it frightened me. Here's why it frightened me. The last time I played around with 3D modeling software was uh, with Maya and 3D Studio Max. Very esoteric. I, I liken it to if you've ever seen, as you're walking onto an airplane, the cockpit and all the instruments, <laughs> that's what, that's how I viewed my 3D Studio Max. A lot of buttons that I didn't know what did what, and it just had terms in there that I didn't know anything about. Luckily, with the uh, inexpensive nature of printers now, uh, software has become a range. There is a, a vast range of difficulty levels, of learning curves, and what you are able to model in there, whether you're using it for industry, or play, or just to create something simple, a toy. Uh, we also, um, a, a, in addition to toy design, we get into package design, so I'm always trying to tie it into um, the digital technology side and then the analog side. And it comes from a, a rearing in the traditional studio arts, right? I have my degree in ceramics, graduate degree in ceramics. I have an undergrad in painting and drawing and ceramics. How can I incorporate tactile version of doing on paper and pencil with the stuff that we're doing on the computer. So you're going to see some of that as well and it's tied into uh, a lot of what we do and how I operate. I have a moral dilemma, guys. I got this 3D printer and I'm pr printing with plastic, right? It's, it's a glorified, it's a computerized blue gun. Right? On a gimbal, X, Y, Z. And this movie scene, I relate everything to movies, by the way. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. And I keep thinking of this movie quote from The Graduate. It takes aside the young man who just graduated from college and he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And he tells them that plastics are the future. What was it, 1950s era? Plastics of the future. And I am contributing to this plastic dilemma, this recycling dilemma, this saving the planet dilemma, by contributing more plastic stuff with this 3D printer. That also ties into what I'm going to talk about today. This whole project started with my kids, looking at toys for my kids. Well, I want, I want that. I don't want to get that for Ava and Lily. I want that for me. What kind of uh, toys would I like to design? What kind of toys have I always wanted to make my own of? And that's where this project started. Remembering that it's all an experiment. It constantly is evolving. I think I change my projects. Gosh, I change them on the fly sometimes. Um, but they, they most certainly change from semester to semester. And with new technology and new process that evolves even more. Oh, our poor maker box. 
spot is just limping along. We got that in, it was installed and set up. And poor MakerBot is trying as hard as they can. In 2016, we went through three smart extruders that just didn't cut it. You know, they said that they were smart, so I said, okay. I'm a little smart. <laughs> we went through them, and finally, it wasn't until um, maybe 2017 that they started to act right. And we started to get really great student work, student prints. Students that were shining actually went the extra effort. Uh, the only requirement I give them, the students, is design a toy prototype, design the packaging for that toy, come up with a name for that toy, maybe even a company, a faux company name. And then we design the packaging in Illustrator and Photoshop using their skills that they've learned. Uh, we look at toys that have been really successful, toys that they grew up uh, with, we utilize mind mapping and brainstorming to figure out what kind of toys would interest them now as well as a younger version of them. A lot of interest in gaming and gaming technology. And the first students, the first superstars, were pushing it way beyond my had a student making his own armor. No clue. I had no clue. Yes, that's awesome. Go ahead with it. Who knows Tinker Cat or knows about Tinker Cat in here? Right here. 90% of what you're going to see is done with Tinker Cat. And it's amazing. Tinker Cat, if you don't know, talking about that spectrum of software again, right? It's on one end of the spectrum and it's very simple and very easy. And you could learn it in 30 minutes. It's that easy. And it's literally like building with building blocks as a kid. There are limitations. There are a lot of limitations. Um, I am after original design. Could argue, you know, there's never been, uh, there is no such thing as originality. What I mean by that is this: before 3D printing became part of digital art, there was printers, 2D printers, and we were dealing with Photoshop and Illustrator. And the last thing I wanted from my students was for them to save images from the internet and use them in their compositions. Now, from a fine, fine art standpoint, even from my Catholic upbringing, ugh, that's just not right. I can't deal with that. Everything has to be your own. You have to own and appreciate what this class is about and respect people that have come before you. So you can be inspired. I'm not saying that. But I want to see original. Same with 3D printing. There are so many models out there just waiting to be pulled out and just printed. Oh, yeah, I printed that. Oh, did you design that? Oh, no, I printed it from somebody else. It's somebody else's design. That's great, but we will not have that in our design process. So I look for and try to challenge the students with original design. These are a couple of images from the toy prototyping show that we had last year in the library. They offered up their descriptions and names. There are two uh, modeling software that I can get through within. So we talked about this evolving digital art class. What's finding you every semester is time, right? We have 60 
16 weeks, well, really 15 because 16, 16 weeks is finals, and you're trying to hammer them with this information and its software, and its software that they never used before. So how do I fit in 3D modeling and printing into a month and a half, maybe a month? So I cover, thankfully, Tinkercad exists, right? Very simple to use. And Mesh Mixer exists. There are other softwares, uh, software like the Mesh Mixer, but where Tinkercad's pluses are building blocks and architectural and geometric shapes, primitive shapes, Mesh Mixer is like digital clay, where you can fold shape this ball into a face and add and subtract and smooth it out. So for the student, I don't limit them to learning just one. If their toy design will be better designed in either a mesh mix or a tinkercad, they can choose. So for example, this mermaid type toy, she found better use with that mesh mixer rather than Tinkercad, very blocky. There are those retro toy rockets again. I think that was my first successful, like, start to finish. She really put effort into it as far as finishing goes. That's something that's not really talked about uh, very much in my class because it's a prototyping class and because we have this limited amount of time. How much am I getting exposed to them? And again, it's evolving. I'm getting it honed in such a way where now they have time to finish their work. The package I give them, the template I give them, is a traditional box, like an unfolded box. If you've ever unfolded a box or packaging of any kind, you can see where the tabs are and how the fold lines meet up and they get to learn what an expanded uh, box looks like and how to design for that when it's actually folded. We also have other students that go beyond that rectangular box to actually fit their toy. This was a like a ball kind of game and she had a bunch of rules for it. Again, above and beyond. Stacked, uh, these are called burger buds. They were stackable burger items and fries. You can't forget the fries. Incredible student. Incredible student. And she stopped showing up halfway through the semester. Incredible work. She loved to fish with her dad. She had a history of fishing with her dad, and she brought every bit of that into her ideas and concept. So strong. That is a working fishing pole. And it's about this long. If you've ever done any 3D printing, printing uh, extruded rods or, help me here, um, rods of any kind. Long, thin, thing. yes, thank you. Tough to do, right? That's part of this testing that I was talking about with Janae the other day. You have to test and see what the limitations are with your printer. Um, I found out with the MakerBot, God bless it, um, that you can only go to three millimeters diameter before that rod starts to collapse or be so uh, brittle that it's not going to stand up to any type of design or even just stand straight up. That was the limitation that I had to figure out for her because she wanted to make this fishing pole, right? Doing my research, helping her out because she really wanted to make this. And it's a fishing game for a magnet or a hook, rather. She made a hook and fish, <laughs> and she designed it all in Tinkercad. Original design, original finishing, 
this was a character called Archie that this student just drew. Um, it's, it's kind of like a doodle. It was a doodle for her. She just always had it with her in her sketchbook. It's one of these repetitive things that you just keep doing. You don't know why. And then it springs up as a 3D model, and everybody enjoys it. Along with this, along with 3D printing, we have original package design and end modeling and descriptions, stories, stories and, and narrative to describe your toy. What are the origins of your toy? I mean, I challenge my students to not just slap a name on there, but to try to come up with a backstory for this toy. I mean, that makes it more rich and for the viewer, how much information are you going to give the viewer? I actually printed out uh, last year the card holders for the um, show, which is also kind of nice. The advanced students. So the students that are, are um, spend the extra time in your class and don't go Dinner, right? The students that ask when you're going to be here in the morning and are there before you, right? Students like that, I push on to learn uh, Fusion 360 or Blender. Why? Because everything that I'm talking about today is free. And I don't have to mess with IT. I do have to tell them what software I'm using, but that's it. They don't have to install it. I can download it, and any student can use it. The great things about Tinkercad is that it's online, so they can use it anywhere. I think that's the biggest hurdle in digital art, is the fact that in the beginning, we were using Photoshop and Illustrator. I'm not going to ask my student to go buy a $20 a month program, piece of software, in addition to all the other stuff that they have to worry about. It's great that Tinkercad's out there for free, and they can use it on the cloud whenever so for the advanced students, we uh, turn to Blender. Thank goodness for Blender.com. I took some Blender courses over the summer. Did y'all know? Is everybody here from TCC? Well, if you are from TCC, maybe this is incentive to come to work. Oh. Blender.com is free for everybody. Did y'all know that? I think I had something to do with that because I complained to HR. <laughs> I told them that their skill soft or whatever the heck they were using, and I said, um, why am I watching videos for Windows 95? <laughs> I had a, um, I was worried about my classes making and so I asked, advising to come and visit. And they have a particular time where they visit classes, and it's Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning, so I had to get my game face on and presented digital art, what digital art is. And it upped my, my uh, registration numbers, which was great. But I also made connections with the actual advisors at TC at TCC Northwest, they started to come to me with parts from cars that had broken. Now, I'm not a mechanic. I, my dad tried his best. Um, um, and I could change a tire and maybe it'll get the oil and poke at it every now and again. But he, he, there was this window piece that was part of his window mechanism or locking mechanism for his door that broke. And they didn't make it and it's that piece up at the top there. So I took my Fusion 360 uh, knowledge and modeled it and beefed it up a little bit so maybe it wouldn't break this time. We 3D printed it. And another application, you know, just common stands, but just a wonderful collaboration of sorts. And I get to show this off to everybody. See, Dad, I did it. There's the 3D printed piece. I also remember this dilemma I'm dealing with, a very personal thing, this waste issue with printing, 3D printing. 
You have supports and you have graphs and then you have orientation of your model. How can you orient your model in such a way that you have less to clean up afterwards, right? All of these things, these supports and these graphs offer and make connections that are kind of rough in a way. And yes, you can sand them and get rid of them and try your best, but it's a pain. I also tried my hand. I saw a couple of videos online where they were talking about <coughs> efficient printing. So if we imagine this gimbal, this uh, glorified blue gun going around and printing, if you make your wall thickness, and we're just I'm just printing out base forms, but if you make your wall thickness the same thickness as the extruder, extrusion, which is 0.4 millimeters, and it's a base shape, a revolved shape, then that extruder only has to go around and around and around and around. Now we're not talking about infill or anything, right? So it's, it's delicate, but it stands up. That's one way we can talk about efficiency. Wall thickness is uh, to have it at the same size of your diameter of your uh, extrusion. Another thing related to efficiency and in printing is separating your model. I don't think I spelled separating right, but I went to college, so I'm fine. <laughs> How do you separate or learn to separate or explode, however you want to term that, maybe there's a better term, explode your model in such a way where you're dealing with pieces that you put together, like models that I put together when I was a kid, right? That are hard to find now, maybe at Hobby Lobby, right? There used to be model shops all over the place. There is a bunch of pieces right there, a bunch of pieces that are printed separately to produce this. Now, of course, that propeller and pin aren't in that shot, but all of these pieces are printed separately and the only cleaning I had to do is right under here, right where this egg shape met with the print bed. So again, how do we challenge the students to get them to critically think about how they can explode or break apart their models so they don't have to spend all this time cleaning, right? I think in my other classes, if I were talking about ceramics or sculpture or design, that would be that would be called craftsmanship, right? Taking the time to make sure that your work is polished, right? Oh, my favorite project this year. My wife and I love to play with names, and Bellboy has made an appearance this year. Um, a take on Hellboy, one of my favorite comic book characters. He is uh, Hellboy's uh, forgotten younger brother. <laughs> Who's ready to take your package and close to, uh, to your room? I printed out, right, I modeled this and tried to figure out, okay, and, and how am I gonna print this out in such a way where I have to do minimal amounts of The only thing that's not in this shot, but you can see where the receiver is, is that little notch on his belly, the back part of his belly. That's where his tail goes. His tail of doom, right? So his tail fits in there, gets glued in there. The top half gets glued on to the bottom half. The arm sockets right here get glued in right there. Minimal cleaning, minimal things to worry about. They're all separate prints. And they're mostly, I mean, for the lack of a better word, they're clean, all right? They're not, they don't have any drastic overhangs that I have to worry about uh, support structure. And there he is, happy as a clown. <laughs> Spreading interest. We had a high school come and visit, and I uh, did this test with uh, 
ceramic stamps, which are basic extrusions. Anything you sketch, by the way, can be extruded inside of a, a tinker pad. So remember that to keep in mind the thickness issue. I think the uh, a good thickness is your general Sharpie pen. And that would stand up to stamping uh, something as versatile as clay. Awards, I've always been tired of the ribbon awards and um, uh, certificates that you get. So I usually design my own for our student uh, exhibition. And this past year, I incorporated 3D printing. And of course, it's morning Northwest because we're the best. Sorry. <laughs> and little 3D printed planes just kind of hanging out there. I get questions from a lot of other labs. And at the very start, I, you know, I was too scared to even set up that printer. I didn't know what I was doing. But it turns out this knowledge that keeps growing as you work with your students and as you go through class, you can start to answer questions from people. And there was an issue with um, printing a large flat thing. So we talked about small things like those rods. There's also an issue with printing large and long flat pieces. And we had to figure that out. And luckily, it was a simple of cleanliness. You have to make sure your print red is always clean. No uh, finger oils, yes. Tinker pad versus mesh, mesh mixer. I talked about this before. Geometric versus organic. Tinker pad, mesh mixer. These were alien heads. There's our mermaid again. Mesh mixer. My favorite YouTube resources. I love Maker's Muse and a 3D printing professor. Favorite tools for finishing. There's lots of ways to finish your work. And uh, lines, uh, printing lines have always bothered me. But here are some of my favorite um, recent discovery has been wood filler because it's nice and sandable and moldable. It's like putty. Right? Digital calipers, Janae. If I didn't have those digital calipers for that car part, I would have been sunk. Right? So those of you that are after um, accuracy, digital calipers are the way to go. Incorporating. Remember when I first started this talk, how do I incorporate the hands-on, the handmade, the studio side with the digital side. Well, these are paper inserts on this helicopter toy. Using wire paper and uh, deckled scissors there. Some more paper additions. This is a, I think this is called Sparky the Chef Dragon. I believe you'll see him tomorrow. And finally, Magic the Unicorn, where everywhere he goes, he spreads his starry flowers and love. I'm going to breeze through these because it's not all about 3D printing and digital art. We do large scale printing, poster size printing. We do a vinyl cut silk screen and t-shirt making. Um, and it's, uh, it's icing on the cake for students, right? This is a these are one of those things that just evolved. And I asked students, hey, I want to do a t-shirt design. Let's have a contest where we all uh, come up with a design and print one. Art appreciation. The modern student will not sit for 80 minutes to hear me lecture. Wow, what a pain that would be. We passed the sweet spot of the court instruction 75 minutes ago. Would they even absorb the statement? Instead of lecture, we make, we make art and designs like the artists and designers we read about. My 8 o'clock, oh my gosh, is it 8 a.m.? My 8 o'clock art appreciation class has changed from a lecture, traditional lecture.
lecture based class to a hands on class where we talk about color theory and design theory. We talk about stencils and politics. We talk about no tan design and positive and negative space. Uh, we talk about calligraphy and brush making and brush marking, um, abstraction. Dadaism and using a uh, newspaper type typography, the ingredients for what makes a good art, art piece, a good composition, one point perspective, pottery, printmaking, architecture, future plans, digital print lending library, which I'm already in talks with. East about doing. Everybody always asks me for free artwork to put up in their office. <sighs> and I love that. Don't get me wrong. I love that. But we don't have a lot. So if I have access to a large format printer and if I get a written statement by the student, can we use your work as promotional for the school? Sure. Can we print your work? Sure. Lending library where they check it out for a semester and they return it. The merch maker club students are always interested in making money. What can I do to make money? The merch maker club uh, concentrate concentrates exactly on that, doing uh, creative maker type things. I'm in a committee right now, TCCD 3D printing district purchasing support and support. So so far we have had to pay for everything related to our printing printer and all the smart extruders that we've had to go through. We are in the process of looking for funds and support from the district so that now they will take that on. That cost of maintenance. Student art cards for the best work, which is brand new. You'll get to see some of those tomorrow at the expo. Uh, 3D modeling uh, and printing digital art class, knock on wood, I hope that happens someday. User interface digital art class, uh, makerspace hub. I also uh, incorporate blogs in my digital art class. The students are responsible for making and updating their own blogs for the class. It has all of their work on it for them to show people or nobody. But for me, it makes it really easy for grading. Right? Did they do that homework I asked about? Because Blackboard is boring. <laughs> okay, Christy, we got to take a break here. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. 